in a design pod will produce your own design document and post it and then the other people in the pod will give feedback on that document. So that is to say it's not everyone in the design pod making just one document. Each pair of partners or individual is making a design doc. So you are free to collaborate with people in your design pod to brainstorm ideas and uh, certainly to, to discuss feedback on the proposal. But the review, we should do together, right? Like, say David and I should review the other group together and write only one thing. Or should I write my review on David's Uh, no. Each pair of partners will produce a set of feedback on okay. the other design job. Mario, that's uh, post your design doc to the uh, design pod channel on Slack by 9 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. Any other questions on that? All right, so we'll, we'll have an uh, opportunity to talk about uh, Lab 2 uh, later on. But for now, I'd like to pick up where we left off, uh, where We were going to check is there uh, milk uh, and if we were out of milk then we would get more. But we had this problem where multiple people could check that there was and determine that there was no milk uh, simultaneously or one could check and then the other person gets a chance to check. And so we end up with, with too much milk adding to our variable multiple times. And so in the notes uh, is uh, a way to have uh, the threads involved in this run different versions of the code that will actually uh, have them coordinate. Um, uh, and this is something called Peterson's algorithm. So that's in the, the notes, so you can look up more uh, about that if you're, you're curious. But for our purposes, we're going to say, wouldn't it be nice if we could have something that I'll call a lock. And we say, okay, before we do anything with the milk, we're going to acquire the lock. And then when we're done, we will release the lock. And here, lock is Some lock structs that either this uh, that this code has access to, maybe a global variable, something like that. And the way that this is going to help us out is that this lock acquire It's only going to return to us if the lock was free.
and then it will mark the lock as busy. So this is uh, a structure that can be in one of two states. It can be free, available, or it can be busy. And if some thread attempts to acquire the lock, it only succeeds in doing so. The acquire function only returns if it can acquire the lock, meaning the lock is free and it can make the lock busy. And then our release is how we make the lock free again. And with this idea, we've made it so that only one thread can be executing this code involving our shared variable, shared data milk at a time. Because if a thread is at this if statement or at this increment, that thread must have acquired the lock, which means that that lock is busy, which means that any other thread attempting to acquire the lock will block, will not be able to proceed past this function until the lock later becomes free. Does that make sense? All right. So I think when we talked about this in 208, we kind of mentioned like if, if we just had like a lock object that we made ourselves to do all this, it would still be subject to the same race condition. And I think back then you mentioned something about how lock was like a system call, right? So like why couldn't we just do that system call if that was the whole lock thing? Right. So, uh, so definitely some good points there. So first, uh, just uh, in case I did not mention this term last time, I don't think that I did. Before I put the lock in here, we had a This code was subject to a data race or a race condition on our variable milk. This means that multiple threads could, uh, uh, the, the behavior of this code depended on the exact sort of uh, scheduling, the exact order that threads got to run this code. And as in, they were kind of racing to see who got to check the mill first, and then who could increment it, and what order that happens uh, would affect did we increment milk once or multiple times. And so that is what is referred to as a data race, which means that maybe your program works most of the time, but then sometimes uh, the way that threads get scheduled results in incorrect behavior. And the region of the code where we have potential data races, where we have multiple threads, uh, in particular, uh, writing our shared data. Because in multiple threads, we're just reading the current value of milk, but not changing it. Then we wouldn't have a problem. Because everyone would just read the same value, and it wouldn't matter which order they read the value in. They're not changing anything. But this part of the code would be called the critical section. That is the section of the code where we have this uh, modification of shared data and where we have to be aware that we could have data races and we'll need to use something like these locks. So the critical section is the region of code that we need to make sure only one thread can be in there at a time. Because if multiple threads are allowed to simultaneously be in the critical section, that's where problems can occur. So Elliot asks, well, 
this lock acquire, what's to stop that from having the same problem as multiple threads checking them? If one thread calls lock acquire and checks, is the lock free? And it's like, oh good, it's free. And then we switch to another thread who also then calls acquire, also sees that the lock is free, and now both will proceed to acquire the lock uh, and mark it busy. Victor? Uh, I think two things work here. First, that a lock is a system call, so we can safely disable interrupts during it. And second, that it would just be bad lock design if two, uh, or incorrect lock design if two processes could acquire it at once. Yeah, so we, we want to, Our lock, acquire, and release have to be atomic operations, meaning that they happen all at once with no possibility of being interrupted by some other operation. So we have to be able to acquire the lock kind of all at once without some other thread getting a chance to also be acquiring the lock at the same time. And so, as Victor points out, we can make something atomic uh, or one way to work on making something atomic is to disable interrupts. And say if we if we disable the say the timer interrupt that the system is using to decide to give control to the kernel so it can change which processes or thread is running, if we turn those off, and whichever process or thread is running is not going to be interrupted by this timer. Yeah. What if the thread just like acquire block and Stay forever without being interrupted. Uh, yes. So, particularly if we take the disable interrupts approach, the thread better not enter an infinite loop. Because if it enters an infinite loop while interrupts are disabled, well, then it's going to run forever. Whenever the the kernel is never going to be able to regain control. Uh, and if a lock, if a thread marks a lock is busy and never releases it, well then no other thread will ever be able to acquire the lock. Uh, so using something like a lock means that we have to think very carefully about when is the lock going to be held, make sure it's always going to be released. And an important component of making this actually work, uh, aside from disabling interrupts, is that making this atomic is going to rely on hardware support. That means our CPU is going to provide some instruction that is going to let us atomically change a lock from, say, free to busy. And we'll see the details, uh, some details of this hardware support uh, in a little bit. What questions do you have about this, uh, this lock, Alan? I was looking the lab, and like in the code for OS3, there are locks in the kernel code? Why are those needed? Because don't you know the kernel code is only going to be executed like once and it can't, like why does the kernel code itself need locks if it's in the kernel already? Uh, good question. Uh, there are locks implemented in OSV. We'll look at the implementation of uh, uh, one of them today. The kernel needs locks because the kernel is multi-threaded. Okay. The uh, a picture that I drew last time, uh, Uh, was to make the point that each process running in OSV is going to get one kernel thread that is kind of executing uh, that process, which means that 
uh, say if that we could have the thread for a parent process calling wait, at the same time the child process is doing something else, at the same time some other process is calling fork, uh, and if these multiple threads are accessing some shared data, some kernel data structure that is, say, keeping track of currently running processes, now we have multiple threads that might interfere with each other if we don't uh, apply locks appropriately. Does that make sense? Other questions? All right. So before we dive into uh, the actual implementation of locks, I'd like to do an activity thinking about uh, how we might, when and where we might need to use locks on a more uh, complicated example than just one variable milk that we're adding one to or not. So I have a handout here. So I have a printout of this code for uh, a singly linked list in C. We have a node that has an integer and an next pointer. We have a list that has a head. And we have a few functions that initialize, insert, look up, and print. And so uh, you will all need uh, a copy of this code. And uh, your task will be to work with the people around you to think about, all right, say multiple threads are calling the functions for this linked list. Where would we want to use locks? So as the first task, is to think about what could go wrong. And here, put yourself in the position of the evil scheduler. Like if there are multiple threads, say, calling list insert at the same time, how could you, as the evil scheduler, change which thread is running at just the right moment to make something go wrong? So think about what could go wrong. and then use a lock to try and prevent that problem. I'm guessing we're aiming for only like the smallest section of the class, right? Not like style function and a function. So uh, <laughs> this is a, a good question about how to use locks in that the longer a lock is held, I've the more time you spend with only one thread being able to do stuff. So there is a balance between you want to hold a lock for a small amount of time, but you can easily over-optimize and introduce problems by trying to be really aggressive about uh, when a lock is held, particularly if within a single function you're trying to acquire and release the lock many times to like keep jumping in and out of critical sections, that's a good way to get bugs. But work with the people around you on uh, what could go wrong and then using a lock to help. <laughs> All right, let's uh, talk about the first item here. What might go wrong. Uh, let's say we start with something like this, where we have 
our list has two things in it. And uh, if we use the code as written with no, uh, no synchronization with locks or anything, uh, what's uh, a bad situation that might arise? Oh. I'm trying to like, add a node with list insert with three and four, and it gets to the new next equals l dot head and then switches over. So you have a node of three that points to the two. Yeah, so we have, we've created a three and a four. And all well, the fours in the separate thread. Right, right. And in memory exists yeah. a, uh, in, the, in the shared heap. Yeah. Uh, Notice that three and four exist. We've said uh, new, so in thread one, new is two. And in thread two, the new is also going to be two because you haven't updated it yet. And like you switch over to the other one. You switch over to the other one, also says new is two. And then you finish one, and whatever one you finish first, it could be three is placed in front and it's three, two, five, or it could be four, two, five. But it won't have both three and four. Uh, exactly. We could, uh, at this point, maybe uh, we switch back to thread one. It then says uh, the head, uh, I guess this is new, dot, uh, new next. Yeah. So this was, fix that. So both of these. That okay, the next of three is two, and also the other threads have the next of its new node that it's adding to point to the current head. Then we finish T1, which says, okay, head is now this new node. So we say, all right, head points to three, that's done. We now go back to T2, it updates head. Again, changes head and says, all right, head is now four. And now if we were to go through our list, we go head, four, two, five. And we have lost the insert of three. Does that, does that make sense? How that could happen? Yeah, this, this is a data race. We have multiple threads, both modifying the head with no coordination or synchronization between them. And one of the most common problems that we can observe is this lost update problem, where because the two threads sort of mix, their operations were interleaved, they were kind of mixed together in time, uh, one of the changes got overwritten by the other. And so for both of these inserts to work correctly, we need to make it be the case that this critical section that does this modification acts as if one entire insert happens before another can happen can't allow them to partly happen and overlap in this way. The suggestions on where we might uh, put our lock, acquire, and release in our list insert. Yeah? <clears throat> Uh, so right, right here we would release? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah we could use, we could acquire a lock uh, before we read the shared data, this head, and continue to hold it while we write the shared data, while we modify the head. And then once we've done that sort of entire, those two lines are what 
actually inserts our node into the list, changing what head refers to. So we want to make sure that those those happen atomically. Questions on that? Other places or discussions you had about uh, inserting, uh, adding locks uh, or uh, things that could go wrong? Do we need a, a, a lock in list lookup? Uh, we don't need a lock technically. Well, we don't per se, but it could cause weird behavior. Where you start looking up for something that's not in there, but then in a later thread you add it, in a different thread you add it, and it will show up. So it's that's not technically wrong because it is in there. It's just like you don't really know. Yeah, that's uh, uh, that is the the issue that we have to consider. That. Uh, we could be in the middle of looking through our list for a particular uh, integer. And then that integer is inserted at the front, and we keep looking to the end, and we say, okay, it's not here. And uh, if we don't lock, uh, so, so this is, this is a, a, a trade-off, where uh, if we locked, with the same lock and list lookup as an insert, and held the lock during our whole search through the list, we would know at the time that list lookup returned, we could be sure that nothing had been inserted in the meantime that would we could have actually looked up. Uh, but that also means that our list is really long, we're searching through a billion nodes, uh, that whole time no one else is allowed to insert anything. And that might be a big performance problem. And so we might say, well, it's OK if list lookup says it's not there when it's been inserted in the meantime. Uh, if, say, your application is going to keep trying to look it up, or it's OK to have slightly out of date information. Ready for it? Uh, we actually can lock an entire function. Um, and this would be something like we acquire the lock at the start and release the lock at the end. Uh, in terms of where we would actually like put this lock in this code, we might have, I'm just making up lock T, but some kind of lock. Uh, as part of the list itself, so like the entire list has one lock that all of its all of these functions use, and so you might say we would give a uh, we give the pointer to the lock as the parameter to acquire and and, and release it. Um, um, sorry, I'm a little bit confused why it's another thread called. Um, like if we didn't, you mean if we didn't have locking and multiple threads were executing this function, they both had variable temp? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll, uh, Monday is when we'll, uh, or maybe next time, I forget, but no, next time we're in full on 310. So Monday is when we'll look at uh, more detail, like where do threads store things in memory? But the short answer is uh, threads have their own stack. Each thread has its own stack, so threads have their own local variables. Uh, because, yes, otherwise, if multiple threads all have the same stack, all were like pushing return values and local variables onto the stack, all jumbled together, uh, that that would not be a workable model. Yes, so they have their own stack, but all other memory is, is shared. If we added this uh, this list remove, uh, how does how would that change the locking we need to do? You need to lock way more because 
if you if you're in the middle of, like say lookup, and then your current like your temp um, node is removed and freed, then when you try to follow like a pointer in it, you're going to get like some sort of or when you try and like find the pointer to the next node, that pointer is now a location in like um, not allocated memory anymore, and you're going to get like a seg fault or something. Yeah, it, once we can remove elements and free them, we run into exactly this problem. It could be in the middle of looking up, we are currently considering the uh, uh, a node that is then removed, and so now we're trying to use this freed memory and anything that happens. Right, Back to my old question, for the list inserts, like if you put acquire and release around the entire function would it have the same behavior? Uh, it would have uh, the same effect of protecting us from these lost updates. Uh, and it would, the only downside would be uh, if multiple threads are inserting, we're currently saying it's okay if multiple threads are calling malloc at the same time. We don't malloc is uh, what's called a thread safe function. Uh, if you look up the documentation for, for malloc or any uh, library functions, you, they will say whether they are thread safe or not, whether it's okay to have multiple threads calling them at the same time. Uh, and so we can allow multiple inserts to overlap in a way that might increase performance a little bit by only holding the lock around these two lines, but in terms of uh, safety, in terms of uh, protecting our, our shared data from uh, lost updates, uh, putting the uh, acquiring at the at the beginning of the function would work really well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, a little bit about how locks are actually implemented. I mentioned that they would require hardware support. Uh, so we can take a look at how does OSV implement uh, their uh, something called a spin lock. So the important bit is line 41 here, which is this loop that we're going to just keep executing until a condition is satisfied. So that's where this name spin comes from. We're going to spin, we're going to sit in a loop until we can acquire the lock. And we're saying while the lock status is true, basically while the lock is held by someone else, we're going to stay in this loop. And then we have this weird looking thing, sync, lock, test, and set. And this is that uh, hardware supported atomic switch the uh, atomically get the current lock status and then if it's free make it uh, 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 make it busy so this will atomically say uh, retrieve this uh, uh, value at this memory location so it's going to return the old value to us and then write the new value uh, to that location. So the, uh, the reading kind of takes these atomic uh, uh, operations and kind of breaks them down into kind of how they would look if you wrote it in, in normal C code. Uh, but you get the old value put in the new value, and then this returns the old value and says, so if this does not equal zero, meaning the old value was not of the lock status was not zero, if it wasn't free before, then we're going to keep looping. And so when we go to acquire the spin lock, we're going to end up sitting in this loop until we successfully see that the lock is free and make it Does this 
while loop step makes sense? Questions on what's going on here? Yeah. So this loop is uh, like to lock up the drill, and that's what we were doing like the drill up to the other. Um, we'd just be waiting until, so say two threads wanted, they saw that there was no milk, they would just continue to, can we go through that? Yeah, so uh, two, uh, uh, two threads are both trying to acquire the lock at the same time. Uh, if we're just considering this while loop, one thread is going to get there first. One, one thread is going to get there first. So one thread is going to do this test and set first. So, uh, and because that test and set is atomic, and that's provided by the hardware, whichever thread gets there first will successfully acquire the lock and get out of the loop. And then when the second thread eventually, whenever it does, gets to this loop, it's going to say, oh, the lock is, we'll look at the lock status and say, oh, it's held, and we'll keep waiting in this loop. So uh, this is called busy waiting, meaning that the thread is waiting by just asking the CPU to keep doing this loop over and over. So should we do something similar for the when the parent waits for any children? Uh, we're getting there. Okay. Uh, so. We need both of these parts, or rather, if we consider the situation where one thread has the lock and then, a, and then releases it, and two other threads are trying to kind of acquire this just free lock at the same time, again, one of them will get to do this atomic test and set first, and then the other one will just continue to wait. Okay, why do we need the first part? Like, what's the situation where the first part? Uh, this lock yeah. status. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we actually need this. I think it's just uh, if we can see that if we can read that the lock is currently held, we don't need to try this, this okay. test and set. But no, I don't think we actually need this. Okay. Uh, in OSB, the other thing that spin locks do is that they turn interrupts off for the entire duration the lock is held. They turn interrupts off when the lock is acquired, and they don't turn them back on until the, lock is, the spin lock is released. And this is because these spin locks are intended uh, in the rare case where you need to access shared data as part of an interrupt handler. We don't want uh, We don't want the interrupt handler to be uh, uh, interrupted. And you could turn interrupts on. You wouldn't have to do the interrupts on and off as part of the lock. You could do them as part of various handlers, but the OSB design kind of simplified and said, okay, we're going to treat this spin lock as also a kind of more heavyweight thing of turning interrupts off. So, so yeah, wouldn't it be easier to just have two different types of locks, one that also turns off the interrupts and that the interrupt that handlers use, and one that is used by everyone else? Indeed, that would be great, and that's exactly what OSV does. The oh, yeah. spin lock is not the only kind of lock. Gotcha. Okay. Other question? Oh, uh, the other thing to be aware of, and I uh, don't want to get too deep into this, but uh, Important to be aware that uh, the, both the compiler and the CPU are allowed to reorder operations uh, in terms of if you have an assignment statement and then some function call, it is not guaranteed that that assignment happened before the function call. If there's no, if within a single thread there wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't matter whether that was assignment, assignment was before or after the function call. Uh, and for this reason, there is what's called a memory barrier 
which just tells the compiler to be okay. You're not allowed to reorder memory operations around this, this barrier. So, Can you give an example of what you mean by that, of reordering stuff? Like, what, what, was that, what would that look like? Uh, I'd be happy to talk about this in obvious efforts, right? but I, I just wanted to, to mention this sync synchronizes preventing these reorderings that might cause problems. All right, so what is, uh, what is the, the, the clear downside of this spin lock approach? So, it's still doing cycles. Like it's still, you're still constantly checking every single you know, time. Yeah, we have this thread. It's waiting for the lock to be free. And its method of waiting is taking time on the CPU to keep checking. And we'd really prefer that there be some way, if we have something that's waiting for a change, for it to just like not run until it's time, until whatever thing it's waiting for has happened. We'd really like to say, have the thread take a nap, go to sleep, and we'll wake you up when uh, when the lock is free, when you would have a chance to actually make progress rather than sitting in some loop. And there's a concurrency primitive. Well, a condition variable, which we will use for exactly this sort of purpose. So there are three things that a condition variable can do, or that a thread can do with a condition variable. One thing a thread can do with condition variable is wait on it. And where the thread's going to go to sleep, it's going to mark itself as sleeping or blocked, not don't schedule this thread, and then it will be added to the, the waiting list, kind of the list of threads that are waiting on this condition variable. A uh, thread can signal a condition variable, which will have the effect of waking up one thread that's currently waiting on this condition variable. And a thread can also broadcast on a condition variable, which will wake up all the threads. That will signal wake up the first one that was waited, that called wait? Uh, that's an implementation detail. Uh, but yeah, the, this waiting list would typically be a queue, and you'd wake up the one at the front of the queue. Okay. So the reading told, reading said try not to broadcast, or um, what? When, for lab two, if we want to wake up all the children, we need to broadcast. Uh, so I think. Being very judicious about using broadcast, like only thinking, like using signal unless you have a good reason to use broadcast, makes sense. Uh, you can think of um, uh, when we, uh, I think later in the term, we'll talk about more kind of advanced kinds of locks that you would build on top of what we've talked about today, uh, where a situation you might have. Uh, a bunch of threads waiting for one thread to finish, say, making a change to the shared data. And then you want to wake up all the threads as soon as that's done. So we should. Uh, in lab two, I believe you would only have a parent waiting on a child. So I don't think you would have a. Uh, I think you should 
strive for a design where you wouldn't have multiple threads waiting on the same condition variable. I think that would uh, suggest you were doing something weird. So I don't expect you will need to. Um, Alright, so uh, I have another handout uh, uh, for us to think through how uh, a condition variable uh, would be used. So I have a simple little example where some uh, thread will, in its main method, will start another thread going. Uh, and then it's going to print ready when that sort of child thread is going, uh, is actually ready. Uh, and the child thread is just has a boolean ready. And the complicating bit is that the child thread could call this task ready and task unready, changing whether it's ready or not. Could be calling these multiple times. And uh, the goal is to guarantee that when main prints ready, the child is actually ready at that point, meaning that that uh, ready field is actually true at the time when uh, ready is printed out. So the API that we have available, we can use locks. We're uh, going to the one use a lock, and we have condition variable uh, which takes in. both a condition variable and a lock where the lock should be held when this weight is called. As weight, the other part of this is when a thread waits, it will release this lock that's given, and when a thread is woken back up, it will, the first thing it will try and do is reacquire this lock, so that when this wait uh, function returns, the lock is held. It's going to release the lock for the time that it's sleeping, and then when it wakes back up, it will reacquire. In the total silence, I am assuming that it's not clear where you might start thinking about this. So the idea is that this while loop isn't going to solve our problem because the uh, thread could see the child that is ready, and then between it checking that and it printing ready, the child becomes unready. And we're trying to ensure that when we print here, it is actually uh, uh, it is actually ready. What's like the conbar struct? Uh, so we can just assume that uh, there is some global. Uh, Maybe task. Uh, 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 there's some global variable that's a condition variable we can use, and a lock. So we can edit all the functions in here too, not just the. Menu. Yes. Okay. You will need uh, to do this. You will need to change all three of these functions to have main needs to wait, and then ready needs to let the main thread know 
uh, that the child is ready. Yeah. That uh, a key idea here is that when we're Maybe. waiting on a condition variable, we always need to do it inside a loop. Okay. Because if someone wakes us up uh, and we try and reacquire the lock, maybe task unready could is also trying to acquire the lock and marks it unready. And so we wake up. Uh, so inside this loop, on our wait on CD and lock, having previously acquired the lock. And then we wake up, we check, we, when we wake up, we, when this function returns, after we up, we know that we have reacquired the lock, so we can check, is the child ready? And since we hold the lock, we know that it, if it is ready, we're safe to print, because we have made these other functions hold the lock in order to change the ready status. And we would also have to signal the condition variable after we're marked ready to wake up the main thread. Yes, sir. In our main thread, why do we have to acquire the lock before calling wait? Doesn't wait also acquire the lock? Uh, wait, uh, wait, uh, expects that the thread calling weight already has the lock. And weight releases it, puts the thread to sleep, and then when the thread is woken back up, it acquires the lock again. So this is the kind of common design pattern for using condition variables. We acquire the lock. We wait in a loop that rechecks the condition we're waiting on. Uh, and then whatever other function is making us ready to go, we'll, we'll signal this. Uh, so we're out of time, uh, so I'll let you go. Uh, this is Franklin Pierce, one of the least successful and most terrible presidents. Uh, that maybe wasn't his fault, he was very depressed. Uh, that's all I have time for, sadly. Uh, <laughs> if you want more Franklin Pierce facts, I'd be happy to talk to you. But I have office hours tomorrow night in the lab, and I will see you on Friday. I'm out of Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody flew it through.